Web 2.0. Innovation. Trend. Collaboration. Metadata. Software. Metadata. Got the world turning as fast as it can? Hear how technology can help, legally speaking, with two of the top legal technology experts, authors, and lawyers, Dennis Kennedy and Tom Mile. Welcome to the Kennedy Mile Report here on the Legal Talk Network. And welcome to episode 336 of the Kennedy Mile Report. I'm Dennis Kennedy in Ann Arbor. And I'm Tom Mile in Dallas. In our last episode, we interviewed Allison Joes and Jen Lee live from ABA Tech Show about everything from personal productivity to the tech you should learn right now to the benefits of attending legal tech conferences. You also learned some highlights from their personal tech show presentations. In this episode, we're excited to bring you another guest in our new interview series that we are currently calling Fresh Voices on Legal Tech with a very special guest. In this series, we want to showcase different and compelling perspectives on legal tech and more. Tom, what's all on our agenda for this episode? Well, Dennis, in this edition of the Kennedy Mile Report, we are thrilled to continue our new Fresh Voices on Legal Tech interview series with Chase Hurdle of Simple Citizen, who is well-known in the world of legal innovation. We want our Fresh Voices series to not only introduce you to terrific leaders in the legal tech scene, but also to provide you with their perspective on the things you should be paying attention to right now in legal tech. And as usual, we'll finish up with our parting shots, that one tip, website, or observation that you can start to use the second that this podcast is over. But first up, we are so pleased to welcome Chase Hurdle to our Fresh Voices series. Chase, welcome to the Kennedy Ma Report. Dennis, Tom, thanks so much for having me. Really excited to be here. Appreciate the opportunity. Before we get started, can you uh, tell our audience a little bit more about yourself, a little bit more about Simple Citizen? Sure. So I'll start with myself. I'm the director and counsel for Simple Citizen. We are a consumer-facing immigration legal technology company. Think uh, TurboTax for immigration that helps guide customers through a expert system or a questionnaire that helps fill out their immigration paperwork, i.e. USCIS forms, and then connect with uh, an attorney in our network for a review of those forms before they send them off to USCIS. I wear a couple of hats at uh, Simple Citizen. I help direct our consumer-facing business. I also wear a company lawyer hat, uh, really focused on company ethics and and making sure we're doing things uh, right by our customers and also by the lawyers that we work with. And I get to use the, in, in what I like to say, the, the legal ethics rules as sort of a, a, an innovation framework uh, in my role. Before that, I was with LegalZoom. I helped uh, run their attorney network um, and worked really heavily on regulatory reform projects there. Before that, I was a, a, the deputy director of the American Bar Association Center for Innovation. Um, really focused a lot of my work there on access to justice and regulatory innovations. Um, And then before that, I was with uh, two pretty high growth uh, legal tech companies, one also focused on the immigration space and another on personal injury and medical malpractice. It's cool. Chase, one of the things that I'm intrigued by the people in this this series is that you you are stepping up to the challenge that I've, I've felt I've had for a long time, which was, is how the heck do we uh, communicate with lawyers and others in the legal profession about technology? Could you talk about your own approach and how, how you get the attention of those in the legal profession to think about new ways to use technology? Sure. Dennis, my first bullet point whenever I'm talking to to an attorney about technology is really focusing on technology not being this great disruptor. Uh, Though there are market forces at work in in law, just like there are in every other industry that we should be keenly aware of. But really, I I think of technology as sort of a great enabler for uh, lawyers to leverage, to create delightful client experiences and new revenue streams. And view technology and learning it and adopting it as as really incremental improvements towards those goals, uh, ultimately enabling you know new service delivery models. I, oh, I, it's funny because when um, I was watching one of your talks online, and this was eight, nine years ago that the video was from, you quoted one of the lines that Dennis and I use so often on the podcast, which is, what are you hiring the technology to do? And, uh, and really, it's about how can you get the technology to enable you to do stuff? And I think that's really important. I think that's all tied in together. 
Awesome. So it seems from your bio, it seems like immigration technology has been a particular passion of yours. I think going back to law school, I think you did a, a pitch contest where you pitched an immigration technology tool. You've worked for several immigration tech companies. What is it about immigration technology that interests you? What, how are you, how'd you become so passionate about it? Yeah. So if we have hours, I can talk to you for hours, but I know that we don't. Uh, so I'll give you the cliff notes. So at Michigan State University College of Law, I was really involved in the in the reInvent Law program that Dan Katz and Renee Kanaki had, had built there. And in their entrepreneurial lawyering course that I know I know Dennis takes a takes part in today at MSU, uh, we were challenged to come up with new legal service delivery models to increase access to justice. And I come from a family of immigrants. My grandparents on both sides, they came to the States, you know, not when, you, when your typical, t- typical white American folks came to, to the U.S. And I grew up around the dinner table hearing these stories of what immigration was like for them and how they started their family businesses. And I thought to myself, well, this is the, this is the practice area I'm going to focus on for this project. And I dove feet first into it, found all these inefficiencies, all these really hairy problems that that really needed a fresh look. And so I decided to pitch this, this idea that was basically um, a guided questionnaire that, that helped you get through your immigration forms with helpful examples and explanations from an attorney along the way. And I kind of saw this as like, you know, a little video chat window that might pop up as you were trying to fill out your forms and getting them ready for the government. Found out this was a practice area that was pretty ripe for for this type of uh, technology assistance, but also learned, you know, pretty early that there were a lot of obstacles that I needed to overcome along the way. But I I ultimately have stuck with it. I, I often say if there is a technology tool that can help bring uh, lawyers and clients together. Uh, whether it's a marketplace or even just a piece of practice management software, you're likely to find me there because that's where I get the, the most fulfillment is seeing technology bring clients and lawyers together to achieve a goal. Well, Chase, I know that you are recently celebrating the 10th anniversary of uh, the reInvent Law uh, 2013 event that greatly influenced your own career path and, and those of others. And I have to tell you that I am seriously thinking and putting in a, and have put in a budget request that do reinvent law 2023 at Michigan State. So, uh, so I might be asking for your involvement in that. Um, could you talk about that event in particular and how important events and networking are in helping people learn about legal tech and and helping them move toward the things they might really like to do? Yeah. So reinvent law. 2013 and the you know I think 2013 was at Silicon Valley and 2014 was in New York. These were these events that really like helped me find my tribe of folks really interested in the intersection of consumer facing legal technology and the profession and also taught me how to network in such a a big room like that and and how to forge relationships and friendships that, that last. You know, and I think I'll actually pull back a little bit from the events and say I, I, what I found most valuable was the social media promotion and activity that happened leading up to those events and the ability to connect with that tribe uh, beforehand and zeroing in on people who were interested in the same types of things that I was interested in and still am, right? And engaging with them and using Twitter and, and LinkedIn as, as sort of these, these conduits to jump over gates and have these conversations that I wouldn't normally be able to have at that stage in my career. And um, one of the things that I would just encourage anyone to do that's interested in the legal tech space and is to one, engage with the community on social media. It's a very welcoming place. Um, don't worry about saying something wrong. Don't worry about saying something that's quote unquote non-technical. There are lots of people out there like that. I'm not an engineer. Um, I'm a lawyer uh, that just engages in building consumer facing products, but using social media as a way to, to introduce yourself to the community, find those people that you're interested in engaging with, 
Um, and then taking those relationships offline once you're at a, at a legal tech conference. I love it when I get to talk to somebody that I've only talked to on Twitter. It's one of my favorite things to do. And, and usually I'll send out a tweet that's like, I, met, I can't believe I met this person in real life for the, for the first time ever. It's, I feel like I've known them for, for years. Are there tech conferences you recommend these days that you think that a, a lawyer who's wanting to kind of get to that point since they're, until we wait for Dennis to do the next reInvent Law, where would you recommend lawyers go? Yeah, so one of the first places that I ever engaged with the community was the ABA Tech Show. I went as a student, as a 2L, um, loved and learned so much through that experience. I think Clio's conference is probably one of the best you can go to. You may think it's going to be very Clio centric, and there are many tracks tracks that are very, very you know Clio centric, but there are other tracks that are just legal innovation oriented. So that's definitely one I would recommend if you want to get into the theory of things and and also sort of the the big things kind of kind of coming around the corner. Stanford's Future Law is a great conference, but it's only one day. And sometimes it can feel like drinking from a fire hose. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you may leave with more questions than answers, um, but I, I love future law. And then another one I, I really get a kick out of and, and actually really find the most fulfilling is the Legal Services Corporation's Technology Conference. Um, it is a great place to, to see the meld of access to justice and technology on display. Well, we should have probably organized these questions a little better because I'm going to pivot back to immigration technology. You've worked for a couple of companies. There are several others out there. What is your current view of Im immigration tech? Where does the market stand today? And then I have a follow-up question after that. Yeah. So today, I think we're seeing a lot of activity in this space. Um, over the past 12, 24 months, um, we've seen relocation management software sort of develop as its own vertical. INS Zoom was also acquired by, by MitraTech, huge acquisition in the immigration tech space. But then we had more that followed, right? We had Docketwise get acquired by the Affinipay family of companies. LollyLaw was acquired by the, the giant Paradigm. So in terms of technology and acquisitions, there's a lot of consolidation happening, but we've also seen some firms embrace building their own technologies, both for the employment-based side of immigration and for the consumer-based side of, or family-based side of immigration, which I think is really encouraging too. And then we've also seen a lot of capital get put into this space up until we've sort of seen the economic headwinds start to, start to change. And, you know, I'll, I'll even bring in probably the, the biggest uh, behemoth in the, in the space altogether, the United States government. USCIS is starting to hold roundtable discussions about opening up its API for all of these companies to work in potentially with. Really big deal when you think about how this played out about two decades ago with the IRS and TurboTax. So uh, long story short here, I think we have a lot of consolidation happening. Um, I think we also have a lot of deal activity and economic activity, all to say um, many of these solutions are focused on improving the immigration experience, whether that through your professional service provider or for, for, the, for the foreign national or, cons or consumer themselves. So I think we're, we're seeing a, an upswell of improvement and hope, hopefully a better immigration experience all around. So that, that leads me, to, you're getting to my follow-up question, which is, where does that leave the immigration lawyer? Where does everything you just talk about leave the immigration lawyer who might hear you say, simple citizen is like TurboTax, but for immigration, a lawyer might think, oh, well, uh, then they won't need any lawyers the same way that with TurboTax, you don't need your accountant anymore. I sort of view that more as addressing the underserved uh, that may not be, not, not be served by, by attorneys in the first place. But how do you respond to that reaction that maybe some attorneys might get to say, well, technology is coming from a job? No, I understand the reaction. I, I really do. But I'm a lawyer working to address that reaction. And, and mine is that uh, all ships rise together. These types of technology platforms are serving a group of customers that attorneys have largely been a unable to reach, whether that be for marketing, or for lack of marketing budget, or, or even you know, the economics of serving a, a client at a, a lower price point, right? 
And partnering with technology companies that are in this space opens up new revenue streams, right? And helps to really attack the what I what I call the the underutilization of legal services. We know there's people that need help. We just need to partner with one and one one another and address those markets together. Um, we've got a ton of a ton of lawyers out there in the world that are underemployed and that need income. Um, these types of solutions are one that address that issue and also the you know the underutilization of legal services. All right, amen to that. We're having a great conversation with Chase Hurdle of Simple Citizen. We're gonna have some more questions, but before we do that, let's take a quick break for a word from our sponsors. You like legal podcasts because you're curious and want to be the best attorney you can be. I'm Dave Scriven Young, host of Litigation Radio, produced by ABA's Litigation Section with Legal Talk Network. Search in your favorite podcast player for Litigation Radio to join me and my guests as we examine hot topics in litigation and topics that will help you to develop your litigation skills and build your practice. I hope you'll check out Litigation Radio and join the ABA Litigation Section for access to all of the resources, relationships, and referrals you need to thrive as a litigator. And we are back with Chase Hurdle of Simple Citizen. Chase, I want to take you back a couple of years to when you were at the, the ABA Center for, for Innovation. And you had a, a, a really interesting, I guess, perspective point uh, where you could see what was happening in the legal industry and in legal tech. And um, if, you, if you kind of think back to then and, and you look at now, what in legal tech actually is exciting you or seems to have the most potential or maybe was on the drawing board, you know, of four or five years ago that's that's now here, then how would those kind of key technologies, how do you see them impacting legal education as, as well as law practice? You know, one of the first things I would I would point to that really excites me, and it might seem a little boring for some of the folks on the bleeding edge, but document automation software prevents, pre- prevents so much um, excitement. I don't know anyone that went to law school to learn to fill out forms. I know when I when I first got out of out of school and I was given sort of the suite of forms I had to fill out, I was like, well, I didn't I didn't take a class about these. I don't know what goes in these blanks. So any tech that helps free up a professional service provider's time and allows them to to focus on where they can add value and focus on the more complex work that the lawyers are trained to do, um, I'm all for. So I'm still really excited about document automation technology, right? And I think I'd be remiss if I didn't mention uh, large language models and GPT-4. Um, I think the potential of the combination of those technologies is tremendous. But I also think it's, it's not productive to talk about large language models yet as, as replacements for lawyers and allied professionals. I think we're pretty far from that. You know, I think GPT-4 and large language models have the pen- potential to be these great augmenters, right? So document automation technology coupled with a, a generative AI technology, you know, while it may not be ready for prime time and client facing work. It is ready for using it to augment the way that you work and maybe even focus on the business of law related tasks and automating those versus, you know, legal practice. I mean, I've, I've been using 3.5 GPT, you know, chat GPT 3.5 and, and now four to really just get pen to paper faster on, on little things that I do every day. I don't use it in anything that faces our, our customers and I wouldn't use it in, in anything that, you know, I had to report to our, our uh, legal department. Right. But uh, I do use it to, to help me do little things, you know, faster and cheaper. Well, I, I just want to say to our audience that this is now, I think, Dennis, I may be wrong, the f- like the fourth guest in a row who unprompted from us has said that document automation is important and so, sort of validating the things that we say on an almost regular basis here. So I'm grateful to be validated in that uh, in, in that regard. 
Let's dive a little bit more into ChatGPT. I know you've been talking about the use of artificial intelligence in immigration practice for a long time. It's before any of this was available, you were already talking about it. And we seem to be in a massive hype cycle around ChatGPT right now. And I think just a week before we're releasing this, Chat G- or GPT-4 has been released. Um, so it's only going to get worse or better, whichever way you want to look at it. Let's talk more specifically towards immigration. Well, this is a more a broad, a broader question than I expected. Um, when we talk about immigration law practice, pro bono, or access to justice generally, How do you see a tool like ChatGPT coming in and altering or disrupting or improving those areas? Maybe I'll go 50,000, you know, feet and zoom in. You know, I I see a lot of promise in these types of tools. I also see a lot of areas where we need to exercise caution. I think, though, this talk of replacement, like I talked about a little earlier, is, is a little misguided. I think GPT-4 specifically and, and the ways that I've played with it now, and it's been limited up, up until now, I do see its promise in making us better and more efficient at what we do. Do I see it replacing lawyers again? No. But I do see these technologies becoming a part of what is considered competent. Like once these technologies are more fully developed, the lawyer using a large language model to assist them with with research, with using it to assist them with document automation is going to be the lawyer that is likely ahead of their peers. And when more and more people start to use this technology, it becomes standard operating procedure. And then a part of what, what we consider a technology competent lawyer would do and know about. So I think we're going to get there whether we whether we like it or not. I mean, the, on the other side of the coin, AI is never going to be able to, well, I, I shouldn't speak so, I, I am a lawyer, I shouldn't speak so emphatically, but I'll own the never statement. It's not going to ever be creative. So technology, technologies like this they may dish up case law to you, but they don't form the argument. They may put, they may push forward, you know, a first draft of a of a of a document, but you're going to still have to advocate for it, right? And AI is not going to be able to counsel clients the way lawyers can do that. I mean, we wear counsel, we have a counsel hat that we have to wear too. So molding all of those things together. You know, I think it's going to make your tactical work easier, but your strategy work more pointed and efficient. On the access to justice applications for artificial intelligence and large language models and generative AI, I see tons of promise here. In the near term, more focused on the transactional practice areas, immigration, bankruptcy, landlord-tenant, real estate. Because of these technologies' ability to surface helpful, helpful information, especially in a limited corpus of information, is immensely helpful. And there are so many people who just need to be guided to the right legal information so they can make a decision. Whether or not they need a lawyer or not is is their choice. That's great. So I think that one of the things that that lawyers, I always find with lawyers is they say, oh, it feels like there's a zillion technologies that I need to know or that I have to learn. And I, I'm paralyzed. I don't even know how to decide. And that's where I think that the jobs to be done uh, framework is is really helpful. You, you know, because people might say, I need to drop everything I'm doing and just learn GPT-4 now. I'm not really sure how many people that makes sense for. But my question for you is, do you feel these days there's one or two technologies that you've find yourself recommending that people really focus on and learn right now? And then how do you usually suggest that people get started learning, uh, either learning a new technology or going much deeper into the uh, technology? So I've got three that come to mind. One I'll dive deeper into. The first is really leveraging CRMs customer relationship management technology to manage your pipeline of 
customers, of clients who are reaching out to you for help and being responsive to those inquiries. CR, that's what CRM software is all about. I, in a previous role, wore a business development hat. I can't tell you how often my CRM tools made me look like a rock star, even though it was just reminding me, it's been two weeks since you followed up with this potential, or this potential customer. Lawyers can, can do the same thing. I'm, I'm a big fan of responsiveness. So, you know, I, I don't know. Some folks would probably tell you me recommending CRM software to folks is, is sort of, a, you know, expected. The other piece of technology here that I'd point to, and I, I talked to about it uh, earlier, is document automation tools, right? There are a lot on the market that can do a lot of really cool things. They can even productize your services and are a way for a traditional firm to reach down into that you know, latent legal market and, and help increase access to justice. And then I'm going to be really boring about my third one. And it's really uh, the, probably the tech tool that every, that every lawyer I know uses every day. And it's Microsoft Word. And when I say I'm recommending Microsoft Word uh, to the audience, I'm saying right now you're probably using 10 to 15% of its core capabilities. That's like driving a Lamborghini around the neighborhood 20 miles an hour. And with Microsoft Word, you can actually do a lot of document automation work uh, with just an Office 365 subscription and Word and maybe a little Power BI if you wanna get fancy, but spend an hour a week empower you and your staff to learn a new capability of Microsoft Word. By the end of the year, Microsoft Word is going to be a core competency and a superpower for, for you and your firm. And there are so many places where you can go get that content on the internet. I mean, YouTube is a, a huge place for great content, but the ABA has got a lot of good content. Other places, Microsoft's got its own good content, but uh, all within, well within reach. So here's an admission that I will make on behalf of Dennis and I, which is that we have gotten to the point where we're the... I think Dennis is the older man on the lawn, but I are saying get off my lawn, but I am reaching that point too. And we tend to be more pessimistic than we probably should about lawyers using technology to better serve their clients. Um, and, uh, and so with our guests, we want to inject um, a whole array of optimism to that. So okay, you know, let's turn that around a little bit and say, looking toward the future, what gives you optimism for the use of technology in the legal profession and the legal system? What are you seeing right now that gives you know, old fogies like us some hope that, uh, that, that lawyers are going to catch on? In a single word, I'd say the pandemic. I thought it was astounding and incredibly encouraging to watch the entire profession pivot. And I'm not just talking about lawyers. We saw judges do it. We saw other members of the courts have to pivot to, you know, the court system have to pivot and use um, technology in ways that, that we had never really been forced to do. And we did it. And the sky didn't fall. And people were able to experience the rule of law in the way that it's intended to be experienced right where you are, right? So I was super happy and super excited to see so many members of the legal profession just adopt virtual uh, proceedings and meetings as a part of their their day-to-day. Uh, -day. You know, I, I was especially happy to see very high volume court systems do you you know adopt uh, technology to help keep their dockets moving i mean landlord tenant cases were were being done remotely people were keeping roofs over their heads just because they could log on to zoom people were working out um, custody battles and and hairy family court matters over zoom and they were coming together because we were meeting our customers and our and the public where they are so i was just again astounded and incredibly encouraged by what we were able to do i know that there have been some 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 regression in many of these areas and i'm extremely sensitive to the idea that the zoom courts weren't necessarily fair for all parties 
but it was a, I think there's improvement that we could, you know, make there. We tried something, right? It worked. We collected some feedback. Let's iterate and try it again. So I have a ton of hope for the future uh, with respect to the, the, the legal profession and industry continuing to adopt as, as it needs to. Well, that's kind of what I've been worried about is, is that we don't continue to require an additional pandemic in order to keep the profession moving <laughs> forward. We need to figure out a way to, to not just get to sit on our laurels and to actually keep moving forward. But that's what you guys in the innovation space are all about. So we have a few more questions for Chase. Uh, but before we do that, let's take a quick break for a message from our sponsors. And now let's get back to the Kennedy Mile Report. I'm Dennis Kennedy. And I'm Tom Mile, and we are joined by our special guest, Chase Hurdle of Simple Citizen. Chase, we've got time for just a few more questions. The first question is kind of what we call our best advice question. And I'm going to give you the choice. Can you tell us either what the best advice you've ever been given around legal technology or what is the best advice you would like to leave our listeners with? Or you can do both if you want. So best advice I've ever been given with respect to technology is to start with respect to adoption, start small. Moonshots rarely work out. So if you focus on incremental improvement in a very short amount of time, you can be well ahead of your competition who isn't engaging in the same activity, same type of activity. The advice that I would give is to follow the same advice I was given and just engage in continuous learning. There's just just so much that can be done if you start to aggregate 20 minutes here, 15 minutes there, 30 minutes there to deliver legal services better, faster, more affordably uh, with, with technology and address the justice gap. So my last question is, uh, who are the fresh voices in legal tech that you would like to s single out as part of our fresh voices series? Like who, who are your peers who you really like learning from and you think other people should hear more of? I learn daily from Natalie Knowlton. She is a regulatory reform guru. I learn from her quite honestly through text message on a daily basis. I also learn from the, uh, many folks that came before me. So I wouldn't necessarily call this person a fresh voice, but there's a, the, the mind behind Visa Now, which is now Envoy Global, is a, is a man by the name of Bob Meltzer. When you talk about being responsive and creating delightful customer experiences, he's somebody that has his head wrapped around the sales and marketing function of uh, and operations of a, of organizations like no one I've ever met. I mean, he's been doing unique legal service delivery models before they were even a thing that we talked about. Another, I think, a fresh voice that more people should should hear from is probably Rohan Pavlery from Upsol. His ongoing battle to allow legal advice to be delivered by folks who are not lawyers in the state of New York is, is a message everyone needs to hear. Um, and we all need to wrap our heads around like the First Amendment implications of what he's working on. Um, I think it will greatly open the eyes of, of listeners to sort of, well, why aren't some of our regulatory rules and constraints fair? I think Rohan's case really demonstrates why they're not in some cases. Well, Chase, we want to thank you for being a guest on the podcast. I feel listening to you that if either Dennis or I had to miss a podcast, that you could slot right into one of our positions and we would not miss a beat. Thanks, guys. I appreciate it. Can you tell us where people can learn more about Simple Citizen or how they could reach out to you if they want to talk to you more? You can find Simple Citizen at simplecitizen.com. Um, you can follow us on Twitter at simple citizen underscore us. I'm easily found on Twitter at chase underscore hurdle, H E R T E L, um, or feel free to shoot me an email. Folks can find it on my LinkedIn page. Hey, thanks so much, Chase. You were fantastic guests, great information, great advice for our listeners. 
Now it's time for our parting shots. That one tip, website, or observation you can use the second this podcast ends. Chase, take it away. Two things. Continuous improvement. Don't ever stop learning. Just sort of a method um, that's been baked into me since the, the my beginning of my, my career journey. The other uh, two websites I would point everyone to, IELTS, the Institute uh, for the Advancement of the American Legal Systems Unlocking Legal Regulation Dashboard. It's a, a huge source of information um, about what's happening with legal technology and regulatory reform efforts. The other one is uh, the Legal Innovation Regulatory Survey uh, done by the American Bar Association, it, uh, Center for Innovation. It tracks those, those efforts as well. And that's, that's sort of my, uh, those are my recommendations in a, in a nutshell. All right. Good parting shots. My parting shot violates the rule of parting shots, which is um, I usually say it should be something you can use a second that this podcast ends, but you will not be able to use this a second that this podcast ends. And that is Copilot by Microsoft. We are starting to realize when you've seen the news that Microsoft has put chat GPT into Bing, it's like, yeah, that's great, but so what? Really what the end game has been for Microsoft is to bake Chat GPT and generative AI into its Microsoft Office product. And that's what Copilot is going to do. Imagine being able to use all the function within Chat GPT within Word itself. Uh, imagine taking a Word document and saying, can you create a PowerPoint presentation with this Word document? Uh, taking a big, a big report that you did in an Excel spreadsheet and asking them to asking Copilot to uh, to create lots of nice charts and graphs and and, and make it into something that people can understand. This is really Microsoft's endgame. It's going to be a while before it gets there, but it is coming. So we'll put a link in the show notes to a very quick video that Microsoft put out on what you can expect uh, Copilot to do, but I'm excited. So uh, give it a look. You know, Tom, it's, it is interesting to look forward uh, with that because I've been thinking about the editor tool and how it gives, you know, so you get things like what's the reading level and other things like that. And I'm intrigued by the GPT approach where we could start with that to say, uh, you know, put this into like a fifth grade reading level. And I, th I think those tools will be really interesting, especially in, in access to justice, but in many other places. So my parting shots are, which will be a continuing theme for a while here, but please don't forget about what happened at Michigan State back in February. We're back in class, but it's been difficult. It's been challenging. And I'd say remember to connect with the people you care about in your communities. And then I'm writing a, a new column for Legal Tech Hub on law department innovation. And my recent article is called Innovation Ideas, Quantity, Quality, and Chat GPT. And I took the approach uh, of saying, what can we use uh, chat GPT for in brainstorming? And lawyers tend to not to be very comfortable with generating a lot of ideas. So the, the premise of the article, uh, which people have really responded well to, is to say, what if we use chat GPT to just generate a whole bunch of articles at the start of the process and let lawyers do uh, the things they're more comfortable with, which is to kind of sift through, organize, and and critique things to come up with the next level of ideas. So I recommend the article. Like I said, it's been a great response to it, and I'm, I always appreciate feedback. And so that wraps it up for this edition of the Kennedy Mall Report. Thanks for joining us on the podcast. You can find show notes for this episode on the Legal Talk Network's page for the show. If you like what you hear, please subscribe to our podcast in iTunes, on the Legal Talk Network site, or within your favorite podcast app. If you'd like to get in touch with us, you can always find us on LinkedIn. You can find us on Twitter. And don't forget, we still like, we're going to eventually get back to regular episodes where we can answer your questions. We love segment B questions. We've got a voicemail for that. That voicemail it, number is 720-441-6820. So until the next podcast, I'm Tom Mile. And I'm Dennis Kennedy. And you've been listening to the Kennedy Mile Report, a podcast on legal technology with an internet focus. If you like what you heard today, please rate us in Apple Podcasts. And we'll see you next time for another episode of the Kennedy Mile Report on the Legal Talk Network. Thanks for listening to the Kennedy Mile Report. Check out Dennis and Tom's book, the Lawyer's Guide to Collaboration Tools and Technologies, Smart Ways to Work Together, from ABA Books or Amazon. And join us every other week for another edition of the Kennedy Mile Report, only on the Legal Talk Network. <laughs>